Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the award-winning program, Talk the Town. I'm Denny Heindel, and uh, continuing on with the uh, commissioner race in the county, uh, I have uh, Seth Higgins in front of me, and uh, Seth, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me, Denny. What about the uh, county commissioner? Or tell me a little bit about yourself first. So to give a, a brief uh, a bio, I graduated from the St. Mary's Public High School in 2010. After graduation, I enlisted in the Air Force. I was a C-17 loadmaster stationed at uh, Dover, Delaware, which is, um, I was essentially the crew member responsible for the back half of a large cargo aircraft. And my service uh, took me across the world, uh, took me throughout the Mideast, um, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, throughout Latin America. Um, I separated after four years of active duty and uh, joined the reserves. Uh, I maintained uh, my reserve status while I was in college. I ended up studying supply chain management at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I graduated last spring, and since that time, I've been wrapping up my master's degree in public affairs at Brown University in Rhode Island. Hmm. So you could be graduating here in another, probably when this airs, you already graduated, right? Yeah, in about two weeks, I'll be, I'll have my commencement. Mm-hmm. Whatever made you want to run for county commissioner? That's a fantastic question. Um, so as I kind of looked back at my time in this area growing up, and I, I kind of took an outside look at it as someone who traveled around lived in different regions, I realized Elk County has a lot of strengths. Uh, we have a fantastic manufacturing community. We have uh, some really strong churches. Our schools are pretty good. Our hospital system is good. But we don't quite seem to pull our weight when it comes to public policy. We've had some pretty, uh, in my view, severe public policy misses recently. And looking at that, I realized we could probably use a uh, strong leadership at the county level, and that's a role I hope to fill. You say public policy misses. What do you mean by that? There's two I'd like to highlight. Um, big one is uh, 211. That is a non-emergency phone service provided by United Way. It's a nonprofit. And essentially, it can connect people in non-emergency situations to resources. So say it's an elderly person who's struggling to pay a heating bill in the winter, it can connect them to resources to help them cover the costs if they're struggling. Or it can help people with addiction find treatment options. We are one of 3% of all Pennsylvanians not covered by 211. Now, it costs a little bit of money up front, but it's only between, I want to say, $2,500 and $5,000. To me, that, that, that should be a no-brainer. There's no reason for us not to have that service. And the other big one I'd like to emphasize is in the recent 2017 federal tax cut bill, they created these things called uh, opportunity zones. They're designed to attract investment into economically distressed communities. And by attracting that investment, that investment is tax-free for a period of time. Um, we did not get an opportunity zone. And there's a couple census tracts, particularly Johnsburg Borough, which should have been a slam dunk. State College, Pennsylvania is an economic opportunity zone. I don't know the last time you've been to State College, but I think it's doing quite well. Um, so a lot of people, when they look at that, they say, well, you know, there's these metrics, and we didn't meet these metrics, and we get dismissed. But let's be real. That's not how the world works. The world works when you get into a room with someone, and you hash out a deal, and you say, this is why we deserve an economic opportunity zone. And it doesn't appear that that happened to me. And that's the role of people at the county level to get in that room and make the case. Now, the... the the metrics they used were things such as um, um, the poverty rate, uh, median income, but they didn't use other metrics. And that's a political determination of what metrics you use. They didn't use suicide rate, for example. We have the highest suicide rate in the county. When it comes time for us to tell our stories to uh, state level politicians and federal level politicians, we need to hammer that number and emphasize this is why we deserve something like an economic opportunity zone. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like you've done your homework in that area. <laughs> yeah, I try, I try to keep up to date, obviously. Yeah, yeah. What about your family? Uh, are they still living in the area? Yes. Um, uh, my family's still in the St. Mary's area. Uh, both my brothers work at factories uh, here in Ridgeway. Um, yeah, basically all my son family's still here. Hmm. you got a nice deep voice. You should be on the radio more <laughs> often. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe I'll consider it as a, <laughs> as a, as a, as a different career path someday. <laughs> there you go, you know. But... Uh, what do you think of the big cha biggest challenge uh, facing Elk County right now? The biggest challenge, point blank, is population decline. We have lost over 20% of our population since the 1970s. And losing population in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but a lot of pathologies accompany it, such as blight. We have 25% of our buildings are blighted in Elk County. Um, another issue is brain drain. 
we lose young, talented people and they don't come back. So, so it just kind of gives a sense of decline, of defeatism. And we are not defeated in Elk County. We are still doing well, but we can do better. Now, obviously, I can't fix population decline. No one can. No one should try. But if we make this community more attractive, more vibrant, more uh, economically diverse and successful, it will make it harder for people to leave. It'll make it easier for people to come here. And that's my goal. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, as far as the, the, the people leaving, you know, it, it seems like we have more jobs than what we have people to fill these jobs. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a massive concern is that when I talk to industry leaders, they say, hey, listen, we have job openings. Now, you know, that's, that's tough work, a lot of the jobs that are available, but it's good, honest, decent work. And we need to try to communicate that and we need to try to um, find ways to prepare young people for that type of work and tell them this is honorable, decent work. Um, but the problem of, of employment isn't unique to Elk County. If you go to almost any county, um, in the United States, they have a hard time filling positions because, uh, frankly, uh, the bottom 20% of the American population has just kind of dropped out. And, and you see it in the drug addiction rates and the suicide rates is that we have a hard time tapping into about the bottom 20% of our population. It's, it's really quite distressing. What do you th- what's your thoughts on the opioid uh, problem within the county? I'm really glad you brought that up. So I wrote a research report, um, part of my graduate studies, where I kind of took a broad view of the opioid problem in the United States and saw how it fit here in Elk County. And to no surprise, we have a problem. Um, Now, it's really hard to say why we have a problem. It's really hard to suss out exactly what caused it. But essentially, there's a common thread of all counties in in, uh, the United States that have this problem of opioid abuse, of suicide, of chronic alcoholism is that they are essentially regions in decline. They almost all are losing population. They're almost all uh, experiencing brain drain. Like I said, it's that pathology of decline that somehow we're losing. That's not true. We're not here in Elk County. We're, we're going to keep fighting, and we can, uh, we can fix up our county where we need to. But it, it is this sense of defeatism. It is this sense of, of generational decline that we need to start beating back against. What's your thoughts on the uh, med- uh, medical marijuana? Um, I'm skeptical of the science. Uh, basically, anytime something becomes um, in vogue, and right now medical marijuana is in vogue, I kind of pump the brakes a little bit. And I say, what's the incentive structure that's making this so popular? The incentive structure is that um, essentially that people can make money off of it. I don't think the science is quite there yet. But as a whole, I don't really have that much of an issue with it. Uh, I think it's best handled at the state level. Um, I'm, a, I'm a conservative. I like things being handled at the local level. So... I have some of my reservations about how sound the science truly is behind it. Um, I think people are just kind of guessing and kind of using anecdotal evidence as actual factual evidence. But for the most part, let the states figure it out. Now, you say you have a blight problem. You know, a lot of people out there won't know what you mean by that. That you mean the uh, houses that are condemned and uh, run-down homes, stuff like that? Exactly. Um, uh, Buildings that are vacant, uh, very, very deteriorated. Um, people who are still occupying them legally, that does not necessarily count as blight. That would be perhaps considered slum. But yeah, we have a lot of blighted buildings throughout the county. Um, and interestingly, there are some tools at our disposal to uh, handle blight. In 2012, the Pennsylvania legislator passed um, a bill that grants land bank authorities to municipalities if they want them. It's up to the municipalities to enact these this land bank authority. What a land bank is, is it is a... It's a power given to a municipality that they can um, acquire blighted properties through receivership, and they can either clear the blight or rehabilitate it and put it back on the private market. Um, And it's not a cure-all. It's not going to fix all of our blight problems, but I think that is a policy tool that we could use at the local county to start trying to beat back this trend of of blight and, like I said, the sense of decline. Hmm. You know, when you do go around, I understand some of the boroughs are tearing those homes down. And uh, what about the uh, the old Sylvania plant out here? I don't even know what the name of it is. Uh, losing the 170 some jobs. Uh, do you, don't you think that's going to hurt the economy a little bit, or do you think maybe the jobs that are out there, those people will be able to fill some of those jobs? Yeah, some of them will build a transition, um, but that's a tough transition for any family. And any family that finds themselves in that situation, my heart goes out to them. 
Um, so that kind of goes back to my point of economic opportunity zones is that one of the qualifications that you're supposed to have to be a qualified opportunity zone in Pennsylvania, an economic anchor. All of our communities have an economic an- anchor. Johnsonburg has Domtar, Ridgeway has a couple factories, St. Mary's has a couple factories, St. Mary's has a hospital. And for some reason, we were unable to sell that to policymakers at the state and federal level. Like, hey, we have economic anchors. You're not just dumping money into nothing. Now, I'm not saying that would have saved the factory, but it would have incentivized the investors to retool that factory because they wouldn't have been taxed on that retooling to keep that factory up to date. And once again, we need to tell our story at the federal level. Um, There's reason to suspect that environmental uh, legislation that uh, hasten this change to different light bulbs ended up hurting our community. And we need to communicate at the state and federal level why certain policies that people in cities do not understand how they trickle down and hurt people in rural uh, areas. Hmm. How did you, when you went to college, how did you keep up with everything that's going on in Elk County? Uh, just, just read the paper, talk to people. Um, you know, I visit here often. Um, but it's really just kind of having an informal network hmm. and just speaking with people. And um, I also kind of pulled myself back a little bit where I looked at just raw economic numbers about this region. And I kind of studied it from, from, from a distance while also still bearing in mind that this is my home. And this is a place that I love and care about deeply. Mm-hmm. When you get out of the uh, – graduated from high school, you went to the Air Force. And uh, you put, what, four years in the Air Force? Four years active duty, three years reserve. I would like to get back into the reserves after graduation, but those plans are still a little bit in flux, yeah. How would you do that in a small town as far as getting in the reserve? Uh, um, I, I uh, separate from my reserve unit in Pittsburgh. There's a C-17 reserve unit in Pittsburgh that is in the process of converting into the C-17 from C-130, so I'd, I'd reconnect with them. And, and they're, they're very flexible, um, all guard and reserve units understand people have civilian jobs and civilian lives and they're they're very very good at helping you balance that i know when i got out of the navy they had a, what they called a composite group and uh i joined them like for two and a half years after i got out <laughs> also yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah what made you pick the air force so that's a really good question and uh i'll kind of preference it is that i don't view myself so much as a republican i view myself as a conservative now what does that mean edmund burke was the founder of conservatism hundreds of years ago. He was the first modern conservative. And he uh, created the social kind of compact theory. It's that we, the living, have a responsibility not only to the living ourselves, but also to the dead and the generations yet to come. So growing up, I didn't really know that I thought that way, but um, a lot of my relatives served in World War II. My grandfather was a, a B-17 bombardier in World War II. He was a POW. So when it came time for me to kind of fulfill a generational obligation, this social compact theory, this conservatism, conserve a family legacy, the Air Force just felt like a natural fit. Mm, nice, you know. What about any hobbies you have? Uh, I like to read. Um, when the weather's nice, I'm a fair weather runner, um, and I love traveling. Mm. Which one of those uh, places in the world you'd like to travel to? Uh, place I'd like to travel to? Um, that's a great question. I would like to see more of the United States. I've seen a lot of the rest of the world. Um, The military took me over 35 countries. It was great, but the rest of the world can be kind of rough at times, and I wasn't always in the nicest places. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to see some more of the the national parks and some of the more natural beauty of our great country. It's funny you would say that because I had the same feeling when I went in the Navy. I already seen that. I want to see the United States now. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, so what about the – you know, your family, they have uh, your mom and dad, they've worked at the powder metal plants? Uh, no, my mom was a nurse growing up, um, so, so that, that's her initial uh, background. My dad was in the timber industry, always been in the timber industry, um, and now he actually works for a company in um, North Carolina that sells dry kilns, and he's a salesman, so he travels throughout uh, the country helping them sell equipment. Mm, neat. Well, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I mean, I really think we kind of hit the key points. Um, I think the big one I would like to emphasize, one final kind of policy remedy I'm looking at, is that um, if you go on Elk County's um, website um, for the county government, it's, a, it's kind of clunky, it's outdated, it's not super attractive. If you go to my website, HagginsForCommissioner.com, or you can just Google me, Seth Higgins Elk County Commissioner will pop up. And I like to think I put together a professional website. Now, why is this important? One of it is obviously usability. The people of the county deserve a website that that's 
easy to use, easy to access, able to find good information. The other one is image. If you're not from here and you're considered moving here, whether you're a resident or a business, what's one of the first things you're going to do? You're going to Google Elk County. You're going to Google St. Mary's. You're going to Google Ridgeway, Johnsonburg, Wilcox, and you're going to maybe go to their website. If the website doesn't look polished, up-to-date, professional, that first impression has been lost. We need to get better at first impressions. We have so much to offer in Elk County. This is such a beautiful, incredible, dynamic community. And we need to communicate it. And it, it's, a, it's a small step having an attractive website, but that's something I really want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything out there that you'd like to say to the voters why they should really vote for you? Um, I think the big thing I really wanted to communicate is that uh, I'm here to fight for Elk County. Um, this, I, the, the reason that brought me to this point is I saw how much um, this place has to offer, both its its residents, the United States. We've produced the men and material that have uh, made our country great in, in the world. We ship our products throughout the world. We are a fantastic community, but we need people uh, in local government who are ready to fight for this county in Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. when the time comes. You know, it's nice to see youngsters like yourself uh, running for these offices and uh, the uh, the the nice ideas that you have and the good ideas that you have and communicating them through the radio or however, you know. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, luck, good luck to you uh, with your campaign. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Take care out there and uh, for God's sake, just be good to one another. Take care and see you next week. Bye-bye.